everybody, and welcome to Lesson 1.5, Fundamentals of Economics and Physics. The content in this video is aligned to the third edition of Environmental Science for AP and covers information from College Board Unit 1.10. In order to understand the way we make decisions about resources, along with worldviews and ecosystem services, it is important that we also understand how economic concepts play a part in obtaining and using those resources. We also have to think about how the general laws of physics play a part in the quality and abundance of our access to and use of energy bearing resources and materials. This leads us to the content objective of understanding that energy can be converted from one form to another. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to compare and contrast linear and circular economies describe how supply and demand impact resource use, identify the pricing models used to obtain money for goods and services, identify the different parts of a system, compare and contrast open, closed, and isolated systems, describe how systems interact, explain positive and negative feedback loops, define energy, compare and contrast convection, conduction, and radiation, and explain the laws of thermodynamics. Which leads us to being able to answer the guiding question. How do different systems use energy? At this point, we've discussed worldviews and the ways in which we look at answering questions about how to use resources from those standpoints. It's important that we also explore how an understanding of economics allows us to make a variety of decisions as well. Let's begin with a discussion of the two major types of economies, linear and circular. A linear economy is one that moves resources in a single direction, from extraction through consumption to disposal. In this way, resources are finite without any or with very little reuse of the materials. Linear economies often have prices that consistently drive higher as resource reserves dwindle. Circular economies are those that incorporate reuse and recycling in order to increase the timeline for the use of resources. In cases like this, prices can be modified and managed in order to maintain both availability and affordability of resources. Economic drive and social and political pressure can inform the movement from a linear to a circular economy, mostly through the application of various pricing models and the supply and demand curve. Remember that supply and demand work in tandem with one another with the goal of achieving some type of equilibrium, where the amount of resources being used and goods produced are relatively equal to the demand that consumers have for it. Market equilibrium can extend the life of resources and manage costs of items on the open market. In addition to understanding the basic functions and types of economies, we also have to understand the pieces and practices that go into determining how we pay for goods and services. There are three major cost types that we'll explore in this class. Direct cost, indirect cost, and hidden cost. Each of these cost types describes an existing monetary output of corporations and other agencies. Direct costs are those that are related immediately to the production of the good. The cost of materials, the machinery and its maintenance, and paying those who work directly with production are all examples of direct cost that play a large role in the determination of the sell price of a good or service. Indirect costs, on the other hand, are those that are not immediately associated with production, but are necessary. The best example includes what is known as overhead, such as the cost of rent and utilities for the plant or the store. Lastly, there are hidden costs. These are expenses that are not directly related to the production or maintenance of the business, but that are placed on the consumer after purchase. Hidden costs, as their name suggests, are not disclosed at the time of purchase. Hidden costs may affect only the consumer, such as the cost of maintenance of a car after purchase, or may affect society as a whole, such as average increased healthcare cost due to particulate pollution from fossil fuel combustion. 
Using those three types of costs, there are two different pricing models that are used in economies to determine how much a good or service will cost a consumer. The first and most common is market cost pricing. In this model, the sale price of a good or service is determined by adding the direct costs, indirect costs, and the desired profit by the corporation or other entity. The other pricing model is full cost pricing. This model is more rare as it leads to higher sale prices, which we know from the supply and demand interaction can lead to decreased customer demand. Full cost pricing is most often associated with items that are produced and marketed as sustainable or environmentally friendly goods and services. In full cost pricing models, the sale price is calculated by adding the market price, which remember is the sum of direct cost, indirect cost, and desired profit to the hidden costs of the good or service. In addition to understanding how we approach the use of resources from an economic standpoint, we have to understand systems. A system is identified as a set of interconnected and interacting components with generally predictable patterns. Each system is defined by a boundary, which separates it from the outside environment or other systems. For the purposes of environmental science, these boundaries are physical. There are five major components of a system. Inputs, flows or throughputs, stores, outputs, and sinks. Inputs are things that cross the boundaries of the system and enter it. They are made up of either energy or matter. Once within the boundaries, energy or matter can go through a series of chemical, physical, or biological changes called flows or throughputs. The products of these flows can be held within the system in an area known as a store, or they can be released beyond the boundaries of the system into the surrounding environment as an output. Outside the system, outputs can be stored in areas known as sinks. The most common sinks in environmental science would be the soil, water, and atmosphere. Let's take a look at an example of a system. Imagine an apple tree. The physical structure of the tree, its leaves, roots, and trunk, these determine the boundaries of the system. Sunlight, water, nutrients, and carbon dioxide enter the system through a variety of methods. These inputs then go through the process of photosynthesis and cellular respiration, where they are used to directly produce energy or store it in the form of sugar. Those sugars can be moved into stores of things like fruit or sap, where the tree can reuse the resource later. However, some of those sugars and fruits leave the tree when they are removed by animals or humans. Oxygen is also released as an output where it can eventually be held in the atmosphere, which serves as a sink. Now that we understand the components of a system, we can start to understand the way that different types of systems exist and interact with one another and with their environment. We characterize systems in one of three separate ways based on the way they interact with energy and matter. Isolated systems are those that do not exchange anything with their surrounding environment. Neither energy nor matter can enter or leave. In environmental science, we typically do not deal with isolated systems. Closed systems allow energy in and out. However, matter does not get moved into or out of the system. Lastly, open systems, the most common in the natural world, allow both energy and matter to move freely in and out of them. In addition to interacting with their surroundings through the movement of energy and matter, systems also respond to their environment through what are known as feedback loops. There are two types, positive and negative. Make note that these terms do not refer to the quality of their response. This means that a positive feedback loop isn't always good and negative feedback loops aren't always bad. Positive feedback loops accelerate or compound the response based on a series of synergistic interactions. In positive feedback loops, each interaction moves in the same direction. 
Negative feedback loops seek to maintain a series of conditions around a relatively fixed set point. This means that the reactions will often go in opposite directions for short bursts or periods of time in order to maintain the conditions as close to that set point as possible. Here are a few examples of feedback loops. One of the most common ones that we'll talk about in AP Environmental Science is the loss of albedo or reflectivity of the Earth's surface through the melting of the ice caps. This is a positive feedback loop. In this cycle, the loss of snow and ice leads to an increase in the absorption of solar radiation by the land and nearby water. This increased absorption causes the ambient temperature of water and land to increase, leading to more rapid melting of sea and land-based ice and snow. This melting increases absorption of solar radiation. From here, the process continues until it is interrupted in a way that reverses or stops the interactions. Another example is the human physiological stress response, where the presence of stress increases the production of a hormone cortisol, which increases sensitivity to various stress signals. This sensitivity leads to greater production of cortisol, causing the project process to amplify. Negative feedback loops, on the other hand, maintain a set of conditions at a set point. The best example of this is the homeostatic process of temperature regulation in humans. The standard set point is around 37 degrees Celsius or 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. When the internal temperature goes above this set point, the body triggers the sweating response to release excess heat through evaporation. This removes the excess heat and returns the internal temperature closer to the set point. When the temperature goes significantly below the set point, the body triggers rapid muscle contractions, particularly in the extremities that we know as shivers. This produces excess heat to attempt to bring the internal temperature back to the set point. Another example in the natural world is carrying capacity, where population numbers oscillate around the set point even though it may go above and below it at any given point in time. As you've noticed, one of the major components that interacts with systems is energy. Understanding that energy is and how we use it plays an important role in our understanding of systems, resource use, and the ways in which we can make shifts from linear to circular economies efficiently. By definition, energy is the ability to do work or heat objects. There are a variety of different kinds of energy, but they are all going to fall into one of two broad categories, potential or kinetic. Potential energy is stored energy, often by virtue of physical position or chemical or elemental bonding. Kinetic energy is energy in motion or energy that is actively doing something, such as mechanical energy of a wind turbine or the boiling of water in a nuclear power plant. Energy is measured in joules, signified by a capital J. Power, on the other hand, is a rate and is the rate at which energy is transferred. The base unit for power is the watt, signified by a capital W. Note that one watt is equal to one joule per second. Therefore, to convert from energy to power, one must know the number of joules and the amount of time in seconds that the energy is transferred. For example, 25 joules transferred over a period of 60 seconds is equal to 0.42 watts. Electricity, a particular kind of power, is measured in kilowatt hours or kilowatts per hour. In both cases, the notation can be written as kWh or as kW over h. To understand how energy is transferred, we have to look at three basic physics processes, conduction, convection, and radiation. Conduction occurs when heat is transferred directly through physical contact or touch. For example, heat conducts from a pot into your hand when you touch it. In the same way, heat is conducted from the surface of the earth to the air directly above it through conductive friction. Convection occurs when heat is moved through the rising and falling of a fluid based on its overall temperature. Remember, air is a fluid. Because it is less dense, warm fluids rise. Once they rise, they cool off, becoming more dense, and start to sink. This sinking pushes other areas of the fluid out of the way. 
These fluids will then warm and rise, thus continuing the cycle. Remember that convection is the driving force of a variety of processes associated with our planet. Lastly, there is radiation, which is the transfer of heat through waves. You feel this when you put your hand over a fire or a hot burner of a stove. You also feel it when you stand on a hot sidewalk in summer. In fact, you can even see it. Radiation can be visible, like that of heat coming off a street, or invisible, such as infrared or ultraviolet radiation. In all cases, we are looking at the transfer of energy in the form of heat. Now that we understand energy and the ways in which it can be utilized or moved, it is important to address the laws governing this motion. While there are four laws of thermodynamics, or laws governing the process of moving heat energy, we will focus solely on laws one and two. The first law of thermodynamics, also known as the law of conservation of energy, states that the amount of energy in a system is finite. No new energy can be added, nor can the energy be completely destroyed or removed. It can only change forms. The second law of thermodynamics states that the amount of unusable energy, referred to as entropy, will increase in a system with each successive change of state. Entropy, in simplistic terms, is heat, and heat is a waste product of energy conversions. Therefore, we can determine that no energy conversion will be 100% efficient. Each conversion will lose a percentage of usable energy to waste heat. In most cases, we can work under the assumption of the 10% rule. Only 10% of the usable energy is transferred from one state of energy to another. The remaining 90% is converted to waste heat. The following slide provides you with an opportunity to see how some of these ideas are connected together. Feel free to pause the video and explore the connections between these topics. Then use the statements at the beginning to review.